Reserve Bank of Kansas City, based here in the Oklahoma City branch. How many folks knew we had a Federal Reserve branch in Oklahoma? Yeah, we got a couple. Now, usually when um, when I mention where I'm from, the first question I get is, what's going to happen with interest rates? All right, that's what folks think about when they think about the Federal Reserve. One of the one of the main things. Well, I have to tell you, you know, when I hired on the Federal Reserve here in Oklahoma, I was told I could talk about anything I wanted to except interest rates. All right, so we take that off the table. Then the question is, well, what are you going to talk about? Well, we're here today because the, the mission of the Federal Reserve broadly is to have a stable and growing economy. And we believe for that to happen, everybody must be able to participate in the economy as well as benefit from it. And we know that the work that you do is key and central to the economies in your communities around the state. And um, we're here to, to, to talk about the ways that we support that in different ways. The Federal Reserve works with um, community development activities across the state in a number of ways in terms of workforce development, economic education and financial education, and affordable housing issues, and many of those programs are in rural areas across the state. One of the areas that we've been working on in the last four or five years is called Grow Your Own, which is an approach to building entrepreneurial communities in rural areas. Uh, my colleague out of Omaha has been uh, championing that work around the nation. We're having a national conference on that here in a few months in Kansas City, and a lot of resources for you around that issue on our website, kansascityfed.org. The point being, that idea of grow your own says, let's start with the folks that are around you in your communities. How can we develop the infrastructure that you need to make your communities thriving? How can you connect up the resources that are required to support local businesses? And how can you help them uh, become resilient in the economies that they face? There's a lot of strategies and resources around that, and most of our work in that space have been with more of the kind of Main Street type businesses. Today, it's great to connect that work with your work in, um, in agriculture and agritourism. Our, bank, our Federal Reserve Bank colleagues in St. Louis and the Board of Governors, as well as the USDA, have partnered recently on a book called Harvesting Opportunity, which looks at a broad range of issues around how can you develop local food systems to support rural development and economic transformation. And so we want to take today's opportunity to promote that book and to highlight some of that work to show the connections that can be made with the Federal Reserve. Today, one of the authors uh, from that book is here with us, Dr. Jim Barham from the USDA Rural Development. And he'll be talking about that topic of how do we build those uh, connections and infrastructure needed to grow thriving communities across our state. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Barham for the discussion today. Thank you. All right, welcome all. I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, there's probably a lot of people I think. I'll start with Stephen because he called me up uh, about a month ago or two and said, hey, why don't you come out here, we're having a conference, um, come talk about the book. And I jumped at the opportunity, always will, to come to conferences like this, where you see a lot of farmers, a lot of farm market managers, a lot of just passionate people, businesses and otherwise here to use this as an opportunity to connect, to learn. So this is awesome. And I see we're starting to fill in more. We, this morning, and I know the weather was a little sketchy. I wasn't even sure I was gonna be able to make it here, but, um, you know, probably half the crowd more coming in, hopefully Meredith will get even more. So I also want to thank Meredith Scott and Moni uh, for inviting me here today. Um, and Secretary Reese, if you're CEO's over there, uh, I'm really impressed. I have to say, I'll give you a little, little uh, shout out there to Secretary Reese there, because a lot of times when the Secretary of the Department of Agriculture comes out, gives a little spiel like he did, they don't usually talk about statistics, first of all. Well, that's pretty, I'm, I'm an economist, so of course I like that stuff. Uh, and secondly, he's still here, right? Honestly, it, it does say something about your Department of Agriculture when you have your secretary here. Now, I said, I think that his office is actually shut down, so it's more than normal to go. <laughs> anyway, 
So I'm really, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. There's a lot of other people I'm sure I should thank, but let me just go ahead and get on with this here. All right, door prizes. Alpaca guys, right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save that and then close that. Um, let me get a hand. Where, where's all our strawberry groves? All right. One, two, three, four. You know where they are. I will, I'll stop. I'll stop. That's not fair. You're supposed to network. You're supposed to talk to each other. All that kind of good stuff. All right. So Stephen and Meredith want me to come up with a title. All right. Here we go. Um, so I use some fancy words like spurring and entrepreneurship and innovations uh, just because I needed something to talk about. And honestly, my, my, uh, my talk today is going to be less about this and more of just a story. And kind of an evolving story, somewhat personal, about just where food systems have been and gone and where they're going in the next 10 years. I'm going to try to do all this in 20 minutes. And if Meredith there, I'd really like her to like, keep me on task here because I don't want to enjoy it more than 20 minutes. Uh, I also want to highlight a couple of things. There's a dark part of the room over here. So if you want to get your after lunch snooze in now, you don't have to wait till the session. Just go over there. It won't, won't bother me at all. You can lay down, do whatever, and you get your little snooze over there. Um, okay. <laughs> get on with it. Uh, so one of the things that Stephen mentioned is uh, this really cool collaboration that started a couple years ago with the Federal Reserve, uh, where uh, I was approached uh, by a gentleman named Andrew Dumont, who's in the Fed Reserve uh, Board in DC, where I'm also located at USDA. And said, hey, you know, this, this local food system stuff is pretty interesting. It's really capturing our attention. Can we do something together? And the Federal Reserve can kind of harness a lot of resources, particularly about convening and so forth. And so over a couple year period, we kind of took, we thought of some of the brightest, coolest things happening in the food system and just try to get them all in one kind of book. And it's, it's not a book in the sense of uh, it can be drawn on with theory and stuff like that. It's just chock full of examples of all the cool stuff that's happening in the food system space today and really help to shine even a greater light. Because let's be honest, when the Fed Reserve puts something out, a whole new audience kind of starts perking up a little bit, right? Um, and, and that was kind of part of the intent, was to get more of the institutional investors, these other funders in the food system, or in the economic space, economic developers, state people, federal policymakers, to start paying more attention to what we know. And Secretary Reese has mentioned this also, he thinks that probably the, the fastest growing part of uh, the food economy in Oklahoma is probably local food. And I would suggest, and I have some statistics and data to back that up, that it actually, throughout the United States, it is the fastest growing part of our food economy. So it's very exciting, and it's great to have the Federal Reserve. So here's the link to the book itself. You can download it for free. Uh, it's a really long link, so if you just Google Harvesting Opportunity Fed Reserve, it'll pop up. And um, I encourage you to take a look at it. And you can kind of bits and pieces look at the chapters. I wrote something on uh, my kind of level and expertise on food distribution and food hubs. So I wrote co authored a chapter on that. There's a great uh, chapter on processing meat and veg processing called User or Lose It. It's a fantastic chapter. There's a lot of really cool stuff. So please check that out. Okay, that's it for the spiel. All right, so what am I going to talk about? Three things. Where are we? And this is going to be kind of non linear. We'll start out where we are, then we'll go back, and we'll go back to where we are, and then we'll go out to the future a little bit. Um, but I think it's always it's helpful to start uh, just like, what do we even talk about when we talk about local food? Um, so, you gotta start with humor. And uh, I'm not sure if you can read it, but this is Pearls Before Swine, a really kind of strange, sadistic comic strip you've ever seen. And it goes, hey, Chef Bob, your menu says you have locally sourced beef. How local is it? Chef Bob. Gets out a shotgun, points and says, let's go, friend. And then, you know, says, maybe I'll just have the salad. So, obviously, that's what we call hyper-local. Uh, but we also know that local, it means a lot of different things for a lot of people. Uh, what it does mean for all of us is that all phases of the life cycle of that food is taking place within a specific region. And this is where things always get a little tricky about what exactly do we mean, what region. But whatever, however that's defined, whether state or otherwise, that all the benefits ultimately, we hope, will accrue to those local communities because it's being grown there, it's being processed there, it's being aggregated, it's being distributed, it's being uh, prepared, it's being eaten, and then they have all the waste products that come out of it all within that particular region, right? And that's the kind of the key there. And part of it is that within that local system, consumers do have some understanding of that food. Maybe it's source identified. Uh, maybe there's certain product attributes like how it's grown by whom and those types of things. 
and then some market and actually has a local product. So defining local ultimately, and, and this is never a satisfying answer, it's really up to the consumers. What do they, what are they attracted to? Are they attracted to Oklahoma product? I heard about one farmer's market that was, uh, that local for them wasn't even Oklahoma grown, it was the county, the contiguous counties around them. So that was even less than the state. Outside of that, it's not considered local to them. But that's not what they're focusing on in their, their marketplace. And others might be regional product. It might actually be products coming from Oklahoma, Texas, and other places, Arkansas, into more regional marketplace. So ultimately, the consumer decides and says, yeah, that reflects the values that I want to say. And when I talk about values, this is one of my favorite, uh, and again, I'm sorry, it's hard to see, but this came out of Michigan State University. And one of the things that we talked about local food systems, or community-based food systems, you have the inner circle there, which happens whether you're doing an international food system or a local food system. It's the stuff about producing it and processing and packaging and distributing and, and eating it, right? It doesn't matter if it's international, national, or local, it's happening. The difference between a local food system is that community, however defined, has a certain set of shared values. Things that mean something to them when they're purchasing that local product. It might mean that they're buying from their local farmers to help the local economy, or it might mean that they're helping uh, to promote healthy eating, or that it's going to help small and medium sized farms with viability of their operations. So it can be all these different things, but that's that shared set of values that distinguishes a local or regional food system from something that's national or international. And ultimately, it's the job of the people up and down the supply chain to be able to display and show those values to those consumers so that hopefully it resonates with them and in some cases uh, allows them to get a premium for their product. So local food's hot. Uh, the bottom line, it's not a niche. Uh, it's not just a fad. It's a reality. Um, I don't talk about the local food movement anymore. I talk about just simply the local food sector. It's an essential and growing and the fastest growing part of our food economy. And you are all what makes it happen. Um, and you can see some of the just statistics here. It continues to be like one of the hottest trends, the hottest things happening within the, the restaurant industry. People are really getting more discerning in their grocery stores and where they shop. Do they actually offer local food there at their grocery stores? Uh, major increases over the last 10 or 12 years with food hubs and farms markets. School, farm to school has grown dramatically. It's about $800 million based on the farm to school census that USDA does. And this last statistic here, is one that just came out fairly recently, uh, about a year ago, and it was USDA NAS, or National Agricultural Statistical Service, the ones to do the Ag Census, did a follow-on survey to the census with 45,000 farmers and got a representative sample to understand how big is this, right? How big is the local food sector? So for producer sales, it's close to $9 billion. And I've got some, and I'm gonna come back to this, this number, $9 billion, and provide some perspective on it. But I'll give you one quick perspective. The cotton producer sales for 2015 were $4 billion. And cotton is a big industry in the United States. Uh, local food easily eclipses that. It's twice as big as part of our food economy. And I've got some more perspectives that I think will be interesting at the very end of this presentation. So benefits to local producer, nothing uh, new to you here, but if you look at, through traditional wholesale market channels, if you are a farmer in a commodity market, you're lucky if you're getting 50 cents, 50 cents on the dollar. With the local food system, that could be up to 70, 80 percent, right? Particularly if you're retailing direct to consumers. But there's a catch there as well, and I'll get into that in terms of some of those uh, hidden costs or those costs that aren't accounted for when you're direct marketing that we need to start keeping in mind, right? We talked off of that farmers market. 100 percent of it goes back to you. 100 percent of what though? How much time, effort? What other costs have gone into actually bringing that product there? How much is left over at the end of the day? Anyway, I'll get into that. I'm gonna make people a lot of real unhappy with me about some of the stuff I'll show you. Uh, I said rural development at USDA, and this is, this is the reason why I'm here today and why they let me speak about local food and why I'm supporting local food, because we look at it as a driver for rural economic development. And that kind of virtuous cycle, that those strong economic multipliers that we get when you make investments in local food, where virtually all the revenues are generated in local food systems stay there, or a much, much higher percentage than you would get in an international commodified system. Okay, so this goes back to that number. I'm just gonna start breaking it down a little bit more as I get deeper into this presentation. So what we know about local food sector today, uh, at least in 2015, and I'm sure it's just, you know, the last couple of years it keeps growing uh, pretty dramatically. It's 167,000 farmers out there that are 
direct marketing or selling their products in the local food marketplaces. About three billion of that is going to the direct consumer market sales, farmers markets like we are today, CSAs, farm stands, farm stores, you pick operations, you name it, you know them all. That's the direct, the consumer sales. But almost twice as much, and I'm gonna see it say that this trend is gonna to continue to grow and grow and grow, and as they've got the greatest potential within the local regional food systems, is in these intermediated market channels. So our, that's what we're talking about, either farmers selling directly to restaurants, schools, hospitals, uh, universities, as well as to intermediaries like food hubs, like distributors, like processors who are taking that product, buying it from farmers in Oregon on consignment, and marketing and selling it locally to these institutions, restaurants, grocery stores, that type of thing. Okay, so that, um, I'm gonna, you'll see this slide a couple times. Uh, excuse the terrible clip art, it's been years uh, <laughs> using them. Uh, but let's go back. And this is kind of my uh, non-linear, linear, going, a little trace of history, it's slightly personal history of, of how I got involved with local regional food systems. So I joined USDA uh, a week after this magazine came out. Uh, does anybody remember this one? This is, of course, 10 years old. It's Time Magazine. But on it was Forget Organic Evil. This was 2007. And it was really a turning point. It was also the year before 2006 that Michael Pollan put out Omnivore's Dilemma, which I'm sure a lot of you have read. And there was just a, a more of a groundswell of understanding. It doesn't mean the farmer's market started in 2007. We've been there since the 80s and 70s forever. And you know, we, we have, uh, it's, it's not just been in the middle of nowhere this came up, but there was a greater awareness or understanding from the general public about this idea of eating local. And I happened to join USDA at that time. I joined a small group of folks at Agricultural Marketing Service that were working on how to improve market opportunities for small farmers. And at that point, it wasn't like wholesale the product, it was like direct market, direct market, direct market. How can we get more farmers markets? How can we uh, boost up community support agriculture? How can we get a lot of these direct consumer market channels happening? And that's where we focus a lot of our attention. But something was happening at the same time because this groundswell of interest in local food and, and a lot of it coming from people starting to shop at farmers markets or sign up for a CSA or whatever, or buy from farm stands, was that there was interest in schools and interest in universities and restaurants and grocery stores. Like, oh, we want to get on this thing with some of that local. So they started forming some partnerships, but it was really difficult, right? And there was these kind of cross currents of change that were happening. You had the direct marketing going on there, but you also had this ag in the middle. And ag in the middle was middle sized, medium sized farms that were really getting squeezed. And this started going back in the 80s, 90s, and the 2000s. It got really bad and, and by early 2000s when a lot of this ag in the middle stuff was coming out. And the problem was is you had these medium sized farmers that were really too big to really start doing farmers market stuff. I mean, they got a couple hundred acres of two or three products and yeah, we're gonna have to like start diversifying more to have the kind of market blend for the farm, farmers market and CSA is really our thing. But at the same time, they really could not compete in the traditional wholesale market channels. Now, all of a sudden what starts to happen is you have this really squeezed uh, mid-sized farmers, smaller farmers doing well the, the smaller markets, and now these larger volume markets, like grocery stores, hospitals, and schools, and everything else, saying we want this product, and something needed to shift. And what ultimately happened was all these at the time, and I know your eyes have glazed over, they did back then, we call them these alternative distribution models for small farmers. And it's a terrible name, it's what economists like to call things, but there was all of these studies that were starting to come out, and I mean studies like case studies of like, what the hell's happening out there? What are some of these best practices? And we were seeing these organizations, sometimes for-profit, sometimes non-profit, sometimes properly run, that were starting to see like, if we can get farmers to start working together, get them to start aggregating their product, we can then be that middle person, that intermediary who can sell to the grocery chain, or to the school district, or to the hospital network, right? And so a lot of work started to come here. And actually, the first time I was here in Oklahoma was eight years ago. And at that point, Oklahoma Food Co-op was about three or four years in, but they were radical. I mean, it is amazing that one of the greatest innovations in food systems happened here in Oklahoma City with the Oklahoma Food Co-op. And I'm not gonna speak how they are today, but at the time of actually providing effectively an online farmer's market, although they had kind of a cooperative structure, was totally new. Right, and used open shared software and how they were able to recruit members and bring farmers and consumers closer together, but in a way that worked for them. 
And then again, it was a lot more like kind of the meat and value added products. But it was totally radical when we came down here and profiled, you know, Bob, Bob Waldrop and what he was doing with that. And that model took off and continues to grow. There's probably at least 30 other models like that, which are more like properly on. And there's hundreds of online farmers markets, all of them based on a lot of the work that was happening here in Oklahoma City. And again, it was other ways to kind of connect those different farms together. And then at the same time, we're seeing a lot more of these what ultimately became food hubs working to connect farmers and get them into these large farm markets. So at the time I was at USDA, this was starting to percolate. We were starting to hear about all these different enterprises that were making these connections in these large volume markets. And something came out of California with farmers markets. All right, so I want to give the, again, kudos to the farmers markets here. California at that time, we're talking about 2008, 2009, we're really talking about a saturation of markets. Like there was enough farmers markets. We don't need any more, right? But at the same time, we're seeing this huge demand from these institutional markets and grocery stores and all these others for this product. What can we do as farmers markets? And they start, how do we, how about we create kind of this farmers market hub, right? And that was the first hub popped up, and, you know, before we had a food hub or anything else. They talked about this farmers market hub network where effectively the farmers market itself would be the aggregation spot. And then distributors who work with these larger volume markets, your Cisco's, your US Foods, your Gordon's, or whomever, or even your specialty produce distributors, would come to the market and be able to act and be able to buy at wholesale prices before the market opened. The best example that still exists today is Santa Monica Farmers Market, which they still do this. And literally Cisco pulls up a tractor trailer and takes out their fork, their fork, their fork, their fork lifts, but their little uh, lifts and gets it hand hand lifts and, and moves, you know, crates, boxes, pallets of product from the market into their tractor trailers and then distributes it all over uh, California. Now, I will say the, the reason why that works is because Santa Monica and a few other markets in California, there are some niche products that the restaurant industry is clamoring for that makes it worthwhile for Cisco to actually do that. But the idea still resonated, and as it began to grow, people, you know, like myself, and I was like, well, it could be at a farmer's market, but really you could aggregate product anywhere. It doesn't necessarily have to be a farmer's market hub network, it's just a food hub. And we started using this term regional food hub. And so it first kind of stuck in California where they were beginning to get these different networks of, of, of farm organizations together and talked about this food hub. And then Food Commons was this other kind of crazy concept out, out of California, which included a land trust and bank and all this other stuff. But they the, the started to resonate there and then like we like to do in government, we appropriated the term under Know Your Farm, Know Your Food, which is in the last administration, and we began to promote it. We said, there's a huge bottleneck, there's a major distribution challenge happening here with these small local farmers and these larger volume markets, and we believe Food Hub is, the, is one of the answers. And so we started to work with both uh, external groups and others to effectively come up with like, well, let's clarify this, let's see what it really is, and ultimately came up with a definition which I'll get to in a second. But here's this really cool, weird thing that happened. At the exact same time that folks in California and other places in the United States were talking about food hubs, across the pond in England, there was the same conversation going. And no one was actually talking to each other, but they basically had the same idea, the same bottlenecks were happening. And so ultimately, we kind of brought all this together into the, this food hub world, uh, which we know of today. And, it, and it's, it's one in which, it's, you know, it's pretty diverse. There's a lot of different business models out there. Um, you know, this is my sad attempt to try to explain it all. And I usually sometimes do speeches where I spend the whole time talking about food hubs. I swear to God, I won't do that here. Um, but part of what a food hub is on one side is they're just the aggregators, distributors, or marketers of local food from local farmers to the local marketplace, right? And some would say, well, that's just what a distributor does. We have a produce distributor here who does that all the time. What's different with a lot of food hubs and most food hubs is the values that they attach to it and who they work with and the added efforts they put to really engage their producers. So again, first they're looking to, to get the best price possible for the producers. Secondly, they're offering a lot of services, whether it's post-harvest handling, food safety, production planning. And then similarly, on the other side, they're looking at the community services. You know, how will they get out and partner or do it themselves to build awareness about why you should buy local, um, working with other organizations, whether it's on the more charitable side with food donations, if they have a retail aspect, getting SNAP, double up, all these different things into the marketplace. And so it's the kind of the whole package, it's the food distributor plus within the, in the local food realm. And we've seen pretty dramatic growth. And the highest growth actually that we've seen was around 2010, 2011, which interestingly enough was during the height of the Great Recession. 
And so out of maybe hardship comes opportunities, and we certainly saw that with a lot of new businesses starting who are trying to you know, really tackle this issue of how do we ultimately link these farmers to these, these larger markets. And they're all over the place, including in Oklahoma. Obviously, we have different concentrations in different parts of, this, uh, of the country. Uh, and the impacts are pretty, are pretty immediate, um, or at least we're seeing some of these impacts now. I mean, first of all, we're looking at about a $1 billion industry in terms of gross sales coming from food hubs. Um, 17 paid employees, it's a little high on, on the average side. I mean, these are pretty thin margin businesses, but still, there are some direct impacts in terms of job creation. But the really big impact here is just the number of farmers that they're actually working with, 29,000, roughly, of these 360 food hubs. You know, if you kind of put some out just together. And what that is, is that's 29,000 small businesses. And this is something I like to really emphasize with people, is that you farmers out there are running a small business, and you have these food hubs who are providing some services to you to help grow your business. And that's where you start to see the real impacts. When that farmer grows his business, you have environmental impacts in terms of more acreage coming under the tillage, you have economic impacts in terms of hiring more people, and it just goes on and on. And again, you get that kind of multiplier effect that we like to see. All right, so now we're back again to a little more present day. And what we have here is the slide you've seen already, but I'm gonna break this down a little bit more. And just look at, this is number of market channels, so this isn't dollars, this is the number of farmers who are selling through this particular market channel. All right, when I first saw this, my mind blew up because I'm an economist and I like numbers, but quickly, is there anything there that looks pretty shocking to you? There should be one, one particular thing there should be shocking to you. What market channel is the highest in terms of mark of farmers actually selling into it? On-farm store stand is 51,000. There's more farmers who are selling either on an on-farm, having a farm store themselves, or a farm stand, or selling to a farm store or farm stand, because we asked that too, right? You have some farmers who actually have a nice farm store, I say, hey, Farmer Jane, you've got some really nice piece jam, let me sell it for you at my farm store, right? It is the highest market channel. It is the most significant market channel for local farmers today. We know nothing, nothing about it. Of course, farmers markets is really high. We know a lot more about farmers markets. We're trying to collect more data, but if I was gonna advocate anything for anyone who has resources, and none of us do, but if we did, I would say, let's really start digging in more what's happening with farm stores, farm stands, because that's where most farmers are selling through. Um, and then you can see there's a lot of other stuff happening as well, and I won't dig into it. On the other side, which is intermediate markets, the total direct to retail, again, restaurants, caterers, supermarkets, super centers, independent grocery food, cooperatives, all that kind of stuff, you got about 19,000 farmers selling through that. And then we have the direct to institutions, intermediaries, which comes out to around 60,000. And I'd like to be able to tell you exactly what direct institution is and what direct and completely only what intermediaries is, but there wasn't enough uh, responses. And this is no way a, a, a slight to direct institutions, but there's very few farmers selling directly to institutions. Again, the farms, schools, hospitals, universities. Most of those farmers are selling through those intermediaries. It's just really hard to crack into. Now, this doesn't mean that some farmers aren't doing it, but when we talk to farm to school, and our census backs us up as well, yes, there's a lot of farmers selling farm to school. It's an $800 million part of the uh, local food economy, but most of it's going to distributors. All right, and whether that's good or bad, that's one way they're able to tap into this marketplace. So what's interesting here is then looking at, there's about 164,000 producers doing direct consumer and about half amount doing intermediated but making twice as much, okay? Farmers market growth trends. The height of the increase, or the greatest increase was between 2000, 2000, 2010, 2011, same year of Buddha's uh, greatest increase. But what is remarkable is that the trend is slowed. And we're basically, uh, some would say plateauing. It just depends where you are. I mean, you certainly plateaued on the East Coast. There might be opportunities for growth in the middle of the country, and it's going to depend on the state, by region, and everything else. But farmers' markets are kind of reaching a growth period. And where there really is, I think, a lot of opportunity is with some of the other direct consumer market channels, as well as these wholesale market channels. 
All right, this is where I'm gonna get in trouble. So market channel assessments is this work that's been done in New York, Colorado, and California, and where they do a deep dive, they go to the farmer, they sit down with them for several days and lay it all out on the table in terms of where you're selling all your products, all the costs associated with every market channel, market channel meaning like you sell through farmer's markets or you have CSA or you wholesale or you do whatever, and figure everything out, and then, and then be able to provide some guidance on, okay, here's your more pro most profitable market channels, here are the ones that are really not doing so well. Uh, you can't read this, I don't expect you to, but here's the main takeaway. Main takeaway is that these intermediate channels often outperform, almost always outperform growth channels. Again, if you're, these wholesale market channels. And whether in New York, California, or Colorado, the least profitable market channel is farmers markets for producers. Right? Now that doesn't mean that that you know farmer Sally isn't making a killing in a farmer's market. She could be, right? Every farm is different. So I'm not saying ditch farmers markets, right? But I think farmers and farmers market managers and the community at large let's take a really deep look to see is this really the best option for this particular farmer? Or maybe maybe this farmer should be scaling back and doing a couple more profitable farmers markets and thinking about other direct marketing or even wholesaling opportunities. And again, that, a lot of that is kind of the scale of the farm, what they're growing. There's always going to be that right type of match. But I think we all have to have a little soul searching moment here that. Generally speaking, farmers market isn't necessarily the best path for farmers. Now, okay, that's the bad part. This gets me in trouble. Uh, but I, I have tremendous hope, and there's there is a huge piece of the food system that is solely and directly about farmers markets and all the value it brings. So I'm not saying like get rid of the farmers markets. Absolutely not, because first of all, it is the most visceral and most important piece of the food system. I would say because it creates that really concrete connection between farmers and consumers, right? You can go to a farmer's market and actually meet your farmer. There's not many other direct marketing things you, you, that actually happens at, right? Even if you go to the farm and the farm store, they're gonna have staff, they may, who knows where they are. They might be in Tahiti for all you know. But when you go to the farmer's market, generally speaking, not always, but you can get a chance to meet a farmer or someone who works on the farm. It's still low barriers to entry for most farmers markets, so if you're new to getting farmer, this could be essential. It's a business incubator. This is a place where businesses can get started, and it's a living laboratory in that sense that you, as a farmer, you want to do some product testing and get immediate customer feedback. This doesn't happen anywhere else, where you can get literally immediate customer feedback on saying, because they don't buy your product, or they say something bad or good about your product, and you can readjust very quickly for that. Market promotion, one of my favorite stories is a farmer, we actually have our own uh, farmer's market at USDA, and he sells beef um, and some poultry. And you know one buys any of his product at our farmer's market. And part of it is that all of us are gonna go jump in and commute out of town an hour, sometimes longer, and we don't wanna be dealing with frozen beef or frozen chicken or whatever else. And so it's not like the perfect thing. I'm like, dude, you really don't need to be here. He's like, oh, I love this market. I'm like, why? It's like, look at this. And he shows me a list of everyone who signs up for his list or his email thread. Because then he has all these like subscription things and he sends them email blasts and I get them. And I realize, oh, if I want a fresh turkey, call him up then. And so he's creating this whole network of consumers who are interacting with him through his CSA subscription or his other drop-offs, all these other ways. And that, the farmer's market is simply a way to promote his other markets. And so it has a lot of value there, a lot of non-monetary value. And that's what, another thing you have to keep in mind. And then it, there are clear economic driver like benefits to a farmer's market. The spillover tax when you actually bring all this food, food traffic into a particular area, how other businesses in the area can uh, benefit. So I got the, the, the yeah, but that's okay. This is the future now. So this is a little bit of the future, and it's just a couple slides. So one of this, there's two things that are really uh, quite exciting right now in food systems, and how we actually ultimately get local regional food systems to scale and can effectively compete in the larger food economy. And one of them is Food Hub Networks. This has come a lot of different shapes and sizes. Since making this slide, I know of at least two other networks that exist. South Carolina is one of them. Um, and here are these opportunities for food hubs. We don't like this, because sometimes they're actually more of just processors, not just sugars, but coming together to try to figure out how they can work with each other. 
right? Cooperation is kind of cooperation. We're kind of competing, so there's it's always a kind of a fine line there. But generally speaking, it's working. In some cases, it's been more of a peer learning network. So in Michigan, which has had a food hub network for a while of kind of net food hubs and food hub like businesses, they come together almost on a monthly or you know quarterly basis to talk about what works, what doesn't work um, in terms of running their business and get help that way. Then there's others that are starting to do shared services. So a food hub might say, you know, I can't really afford an accountant. I just need an account for like one eighth of the time. So maybe the eight of us can actually afford one accountant and they can make their way around, make sure our books are in order. Same thing could be with insurance policies and things like that. So we're seeing some of that. And then I think the thing that is really exciting to me is that food hubs are actually trading with each other. So for example, I'm in Colorado, there's four food hubs that work with each other. Different parts of Colorado, just like Oklahoma, have different microclimates, different stuff grows better than other parts. And so each hub has its own kind of marketplace, catchment area where they're doing their business. But they want to pull product from all over Colorado. So they partner with these other hubs that are buying and trading back and forth. And this allows them to have great product diversity and allows them to get some of the buying they wouldn't be if they were just working with their local producers. And so we're going to see a lot more of that happen. Okay, so that's one thing. So this is what I call kind of this the vertical coordination, sorry, horizontal coordination of, of all these different food hub businesses and like businesses working together, both statewide and regionally. And then the other is this idea of a food innovation cluster, another fancy, stupid word, but it's this idea of co-locating the entire supply chain in one place. So if you think of like a food hub, right, where you have kind of aggregation, distribution, storage, marketing happening, then you lump on everything else from production to processing to having a community kitchen, to retailing and recycling, you end up getting this idea of a food cluster. And this is also happening. So this is creating this really deep kind of vertical coordination, not integration. It's not like one business doing all of this. It's a bunch of businesses working together to solve a lot of supply chain issues, just like you would find in any kind of business cluster. So there's one in Chicago called Local Foods, which is doing amazing stuff. Um, I won't go into it, but they've got everything from the distribution of butcher to restaurant to community center, uh, kitchen incubator, everything kind of co-located, and this is in Chicago. And then, but it's not just an urban, and I always want to emphasize this, in Verwoka, Wisconsin, very small uh, place in Wisconsin, there's another kind of food enterprise center which brings all these different food and health businesses together that create all these nice synergies by actually being in the same place. Right? Just like we find these synergies when you have farmers at the farmer's market in the same place so they can actually learn from each other and figure out different ways of marketing with each other. That's the same thing that's happening. So that ultimately is that kind of regional food economics and that vision that is happening. So it's the future, but we're seeing it now, both that kind of horizontal coordination of food hub networks and then these kind of really deep supply chain, uh, vertically coordinated uh, clusters of local food businesses. All right, and I know she really wants to go to this stage, so this is it. All right, we're at a point now when we talk about core businesses, or sorry, core local food shareholders, this is your farmer's market people who come every week. These are the people that sign up for the CSA subscription and stay with you, they're core. But that's not enough to actually change our food economy. It just isn't. What we need to get into is that mid-level and ultimately the entire pie. And where I would say we are now, we're in that mid-level piece. And what we want is to continue to grow. So it becomes more mainstream, but still managing and hopefully to keep those, those same set of shared values. All right, and the, here's the perspective, which I think sometimes blows people away, and it's not apples for apples, so it's not totally, totally fair. But in 2015, uh, we put out the organic produce, uh, sorry, the organic survey, um, just looking at food, um, of US food organic suppliers, and their overall sales were 6.2 billion. And the local food is 8.7 billion, so it's a, it's a bigger part of the food contract. And there's a lot of organic producers also be local, so I'll grant you that. But this was really cool. So OTA, the Organic Trade Association, every year puts out that you know the organic industry, right? So the produce sales is 6.2, but the industry is 43 billion dollars, right? And that's because you have everything from packaged goods like. Annie's mac and cheese that has organic ingredients, although I'm not sure how much of that is actually coming from the US or not. We can like go back and forth. But that's a factor of seven. That's actual, right, of this $40 billion industry. What if local food had that same factor of seven? Where would we be? It would be a $60 billion industry. It would be off the charts. Now, granted, we're not there. We're not having locally sourced peanuts in our cliff bars yet. But we are getting there, right? 
and this is a $60 billion industry, and I swear I'm gonna end. Here's the, the final catch. So I Googled, when I first put this together, what is a $60 billion industry, right? And so I have to a little note, note here. Here's our $60 billion industry comparison. The entire North American sports market industry is $60 billion, all right? That's gate revenue, media rights, sponsorship, merchandise. We are, in the near future, gonna be as big as the sports market industry. And I'm, not, I'm really not trying to be too hyperbolic here. So one of my friends who runs Green Market in New York City, he likes to say this, and it is true. Green Market runs about 50 farmers markets in New York City. And he says, we're bigger than the Yankees. And they are. Of course, I believe really upsets a lot of people here in New York City, but that's the bottom line. We are bigger than the Yankees. Thank you.